Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. Uh, so, welcome everybody to San Diego Sunday Assembly, 105th Assembly, and 33rd Online Assembly. Okay, so uh, the people in the room here today, the humans uh, in the room, we'll call our Roomblers. And the people who are going to be participating or watching on Zoom will call a Zoomblers. So a Zoomblers meet a Roomblers, a Roomblers meet a Zoomblers. Zoomblers, if you want to see Zoomblers, they're right over there. Uh, so every assembly has a theme. And today's theme is Blue Clue, which is not copyright infringement. Uh, so there is a media free zone in the back. Uh, for people who want to avoid being on camera, uh, child care, we provide free child care for kids one and a half and up today by a, uh, our teenage volunteer, Lelia. Lovely, I know her. Um, and right over there, so you can uh, take a breather here. And we'll start off. Yes. With a sing along. Blue Moon by Paul. Got it. Well, not written by Paul. No, no, unfortunately, no. Uh-oh, what'd you do? What'd you do? Did you touch something? Excuse me a second. We're kind of working. Short staff. Okay, so while they arrange that, I'll tell you a series of puns. Okay, give me any topic. Come on. Oh, they got it up. <laughs> tell, tell the joke, man. Oh, Come on. Rogue again. <laughs> this is an old, old, old song, but it's a, it's a nice song. Besides that, I like old, old, old songs sometimes. A blue moon. Saw me standing alone Without a dream in my heart Without a love of my own Let's sing that again. Back it up one there. Blue moon, let me hear you sing I could be standing alone Without a dream in my heart Without a love of my own Oh, blue moon, you knew just what I was there for. You heard me say in a prayer for someone I could really care for. There's the bridge. And then suddenly something appeared for me. The only one my heart could ever hold. I heard someone whisper, please adore me. And when I looked, the moon had turned to gold. And I'm no longer alone. Without a dream in my heart. Without a love of my own. Yeah, you guys sound good. Now, this is a song where the conflict was that the singer had a dream in his heart and not a love of his own and literally one bridge and two verses later all is well to, to, why don't we get to have that right well we can always sing about it take that last verse again oh moon you saw me standing alone without a dream in my heart Without a love of my own Oh, blue moon You saw me standing alone Without a dream in my heart Oh, no, without a love in my own I 
I'd ask you to whistle, but I know what kind of a disaster that would be. All right, good singing. First time I'm seeing, and I have to say, being up here, y'all sound great. <laughs> Normally I'm sitting there and I don't hear people very well, but up here I can hear you all and it's lovely. Um, I know, that's why I stand up here, because I can hear. <laughs> uh, so I just want to give a, a brief introduction to Sunday Assembly and what we do. So we are San Diego Sunday Assembly, and we have three parts to our model, that is live better, help often, and wonder more. Um, so we'll start off with uh, live better. And as part of that, as a part of a community organization, uh, we like to share with each other uh, events that happen in our lives. And uh, I'll be reading a few of them uh, for you guys now. Now, some of these don't have names attached to them. If they were yours and you want to say hi, that's great. If not, that's that's fine too. Um, so Cindy Hall is back in town from her trip to England, along along with several other assemblers. She attended the International Conference of Sunday Assemblers in Brighton. Uh, she had an awesome time and is now joining us by Zoom from Ramona. Um, so that's cool. Hi. <laughs> Um, so this one just says meetup app, cool. There is a meetup app and we have a meetup page that we have all of our uh, events on. Highly recommend you go there uh, and then when there, look at our events and then if you wanna come to our events, they are gonna come so that we can count and have an idea of how many people are coming. This one is anonymous. Um, it says we had, an, first of all, anonymous. Lovely handwriting, thank you. Make my life a lot easier. We had an amazing time at the Pride Parade yesterday and loads of people showed up at our booth. Uh, we have a page and a half of signups for our email newsletter as of yesterday. Oh, this was by the Sunday Assembly Pride Committee. I know you guys, cool. <laughs> so we have been over a while now following Terry's brother's journey across the Appalachian Trail. Um, ooh. And as of three days ago, his brother was at, I can't believe this, 1,864 miles along the trail with only 326 miles left to go. Wow. Good luck, Terry's brother. Uh, so this one is another anonymous. Um, oh, it's real sweet. I appreciate this. Uh, so it starts off a lot less, a bit less sweet. Relationship issues have motivated me to pursue activities that I can do independently. Uh, I'm familiar with Sunday Assembly. Well, it says SA. I assume it means Sunday Assembly. Like, uh, it could be, like, yeah, safety assembly, that kind of thing. I think it's us, though. Uh, and it provides a fun, positive outlet. So thank you. Uh, I love being a part of it, and I'm happy that you are too. Yeah. Uh, so this is the, the last one, and it's more of an announcement than a life happens, but uh, we didn't have it on the schedule. So Stephanie is joining us from Zoom. Hi, Stephanie. Uh, she would like to remind people about the movie passes that you can find on Meetup. So we have moody movie passes that you can use uh, to go with us to a cool movie. And the next one is Haunted Mansion. And if you go uh, get with Stephanie afterwards for a group photo so that everyone can see how awesome you are and how sad it is that they missed out. Uh, I have one more. Yes. I, sorry, I forgot to write it down, but I don't usually follow the rules. Um, uh, Wendy and I, my wife Wendy and I, celebrated our 41st wedding anniversary. <laughs> Somehow I found somebody to marry who tolerated me through all of this. So. Um, and, and just as a, 
uh, thing for my own. Uh, I visited my hometown for the first time in almost 10 years to show my fiance Sarah around all the, the haunts that I went to as a kid. Um, and we went to the Niagara River and put our feet in the river and saw Devil's Hole and uh, Lake Ontario and saw Toronto over the lake, so that was real cool. Nice. All right. So that was Live Better. Uh, help often. Uh, Sunday Assembly, we like to do things that help out around the community, and we have uh, Betsy here to give some information about upcoming and past Help Often events. Um, um, August is towards the end of our San Diego tourist season, so we've adopted our beach area our adopted beach area should be chock full of trashy cleanup goodness. Let's knock this one out of the park. We'll be cleaning up our adopted beach at South Shores on Saturday, August 12th at 10 a.m. We provide all the supplies, but if you have a reusable water bottle, gloves, or a bucket, you can bring them along to help reduce the amount of waste we generate. Sometimes we pick up 50, 60, 80 pounds of trash. It's really pretty impressive. So please join us for the beach cleanup if you can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Betsy. So uh, the last part is Wonder More. And for Wonder More this week, we have a uh, reading and then a speaker. So the reading uh, is Field Guide by Billy Collins, and it's going to be read by uh, my good friend Charles. Uh, and everyone, please welcome him up. Field Guide by Billy Collins. No one I ask knows the name of the flower we pulled the car this, to the side of the road to pick and that I point to dangling purple from my lapel. I am passing through the needle of spring in North Carolina as ignorant of the flowers of the South as the woman at the barbecue stand who laughs and the man who gives me a look as he pumps the gas and everyone else I ask on the way to the airport to return to where this purple madness is not seen blazing against the silver pines and rioting along the roadside. On the plane, the stewardess is afraid she cannot answer my question, now insistent with the fear that I will leave the province of this flower without its sound in my ear. Then, as if he were giving me the time of day, a passenger looks up from his magazine and says, Wisteria. Thank you so much, Charles. I really, I really like that poem. When I was a kid, I was like, I think poetry is for nerds. And then when I grew up, I was like, well, here's to you, little kid. I am a nerd. <laughs> um, so our speaker today is going to be uh, Dr. Eileen Bedett, Beckett. Sorry. Um, she is an assistant professor of biological sciences in the College of Science. Oh, that's much better. College of Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics at CSUSM. She earned her PhD in Molecular Biology from the University of California, Los Angeles, and BS in Electrochemistry from University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Beckett is a bacterial genomicist and expert in the next generation sequencing assay development and applications with over 15 years of assay development experience in academia and in the biotechnology industry. I understood some of those words. Um, but I'm sure I'm going to understand them better in a bit. Dr. Beckett leads an undergraduate-focused laboratory that examines the effects of urban runoff on Southern California coastal microbiomes. And she is deeply committed to connecting students with mentors across different sectors towards innovation in the life sciences and beyond. Dr. Beckett will be staying after the assembly to chat, so please hold any questions until then. Uh, thank you, and everyone give a warm welcome to Dr. Beckett. Uh, yes, like I said, go for it.
a professional is on the job. Testing. Oh, there it is. Woo! I tend to project anyway, but uh, for the benefit of all the Twitterverse on Zoom and others as well, nice to have this mic set up. Um, hi, everyone. It's so awesome to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. I'm supposed to stay away from one of the speakers. That one. That one. Okay, cool. So it doesn't remember. Right? Um, so I'm going to tell you a fun story about uh, the soup that blew up Twitter. This was the title that Twitter actually voted on as the one to use, so democracy rules, right? Um, and so, um, this is, so I've been a microbiologist for 16 years, and yet the thing that I am most known for is the soup that rotted in the back of my fridge. That, this is not my fridge. My fridge, this has way more fresh produce than my fridge does. I will be a college student forever. But it's similar to what it would look like. But, um, but this is not just a story about the science experiment in the back of my fridge. It is also a story about the joy that science can bring, the community that science can bring, and the education to the general public that science can bring, and how Twitter played a role. Twitter and a great community on there played a role in it. So this all started with the birthday tradition. My mom, uh, every year for my birthday, lovingly makes this delicious beef soup that is her grandmother's recipe. And um, it is just, it, it warms me up both physically and it warms my heart up. You know, it's just, it's one of those I look forward to every single year and she makes me like this giant vat of it. So I've got leftovers and fresh stuff in my fridge for a certain period of time. And so <laughs> this past year, uh, I, was going in and like taking my leftovers, you know, like ladling out because I just had the pot in the back of the fridge and I kept on like ladling and everything and I had a little bit left over. And you know when it's been like a week and some and then you're just like, okay, maybe not anymore. Maybe I won't go back into that anymore. Maybe some of you are better than me, but it's a thing. And so, um, oh, you can't really see the soup as well up here. But uh, so the, so after a while, it was just forgotten in the back. Of the, of the fridge and a month goes by and my fiance is like, okay, it's time to actually, let's actually clean out the fridge and be like adults for a second. And so, uh, so then I tweeted, okay, I'm outing myself here, but there was this forgotten beef soup in our fridge and we just cleaned it out and it was blue, like, like bright blue. I'm like, what the F contam would, contamination would make it blue, like bright blue. And even with all my years in micro, I'm just like not handling this well. I'm just like, ah. And I should have known that, because my Twitter community is mostly microbiologists, that they would not let it slide. So we had uh, people start chiming in. So Kat, who's not, a, she's not a scientist, but she managed to get adopted by the science Twitter community. Um, but she was like, please tell me that you have a photo. And I was like, I was too busy gagging to try to, try to get, I don't want to risk my phone or risk vomiting. I was like holding my breath the whole time. And she's like, come on, Aline, what kind of scientist are you? You didn't even document your findings. And I'm like, oh, you just hit the, you hit the twinge. But a bunch of others were also saying like, you know, you got to, you got to, come on, you got to send us a photo. You can't just leave us like this. And I'm like, there are, there are limits about what I'm willing to do for science, for sure. Um, and then more and more people were like jumping in. I'm like, no, I am not going back into the trash. It is double bagged in there. I poured the soup out, you know, like those, those like thick reusable like grocery bags. And so I double bagged those, tied it up and threw it in the trash. Um, you could tell I wasn't even typing well how like distracted I was by this whole thing. But of course I should have known that my audience was like a group of microbiologists and would not let this slide. So after that little while I was like, okay, I can't believe y'all talked me into going back into the trash. Warning if you have a squeamish stomach. It is bright blue. Um, it's a little dim up there, but if you actually see like the full photo, you can go on my Twitter, it's on the pinned tweet, and it's like bright up there. And so then that's when Twitter erupted, because <laughs> they're like, this is like microbiologist dream, right? That's how penicillin was discovered, was from rotting food. 
So, so we have people, people like, you might have found the newest antibiotic. Take a sample, please. And I'm like, I'm not going back in a second time. You've got to be kidding me. And so then Helen was like, hit it with the black light and see if it glows. Like, everyone's telling me, sample, do different things. I'm like, I am not going back into the trash a second time. And so then Michael chimes in with, hey, it's not our fault you didn't save a sample for testing. And I was like, oh, you know. He, know, he knows how to, like, make my, my little stubborn, like, brat, like, come up and everything. So, um, so I was like, oh my God, no, you guys, I'm not, this is gross. It's been sitting out there for a day now. You got to be kidding me. So then in comes Sebastian, <coughs> who's, that, who's the second main player in the story. Sequence it. Oh my God, I'll pay for the flow cell. That's the, the actual, uh, like, the, the, the part that you do the sequencing on. It can range from anywhere from like 600 to like $8,000 for sequencing, depending on how much that, that you want to sequence. Um, and I'm like, I'm not going back in the trash. It's been sitting outside for a day. There's no way. And so he's, but, but, but these Zurins. And then Pedro chimes in and piles on. This would be the coolest paper idea of all times. Come on. And then I was like, they're going back and forth. I'm like, you guys, I'm like 43% tempted to go back into the trash. And so, and Sebastian, he won't let up. He's like, honestly, even a little ep tube, like this little like plastic tubes you see, or even a Q-tip would suffice. Because like, nausea is temporary. Glory is forever. <laughs> and he's like, we can even call it Beckett Blue. Come on. And I'm like, like Sebastian. And then a few hours later, in comes, come on, it's not working. the next, next slide? It's not working for some reason. There we go. I'm never forgiving you for this. So, <laughs> so I, take, uh, I take a photo. I literally, because I was at home, and I'm like, I'm not going to lab to get a swab and coming back. I literally went upstairs to my bathroom, got a Q-tip, opened it up, dunked it in there. Bleh, like, it's all up on my arm and stuff. And then I threw it into a Tupperware that I had, and I'm like, I'm absolutely never forgiving you for this. So Sebastian just like, was like, yeah, let's do it. Because his passion is to be able to isolate different blue genes so he could do some sort of plant bio bioengineering. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But he's always wanted to do blue. He wanted to make like a blue rose, things like that. So he's like a really obsessed with this color. And so then we went back and forth and he convinced me to go back in a third time so that we can get eight swabs so we can do all the different tests and stuff. And I'm like, that's the last time I'm going in. He goes, a true hero, the soup may rest in pieces. <laughs> So I'd like to introduce Sebastian a little bit more. He is a self-taught, quote, amateur biologist with no formal training or degree. And so I put it in quotes because Sebastian is by no means an amateur. He uh, operates a home lab and has been working in the bl plant bio bioengineering sector for 15 years. And he's such a brilliant person. Like he, like he knows as much as like pretty much any f professor that I know. And He's also like the purest human being that I've met. He just is always just wants to like make the world better and make, the, make everything around him better. And his research focuses on bridging the gap between research and education, working on tools and techniques that allow everyone to be able to participate in science. And so one example is he's engineered these safe uh, bacterial strains that are these, all these different colors of the rainbow so that he could, as people can paint with bacteria to be able to learn different things about science, and as well as be able to use these in different types of experiments that, that many labs use as well. So Sebastian's awesome, and he's just like so eager. He's like, let's study this, let's study this, right? So the investigation begins. But first, the cat's out of the bag. So my mom came across the thread, <laughs> and I had to answer for the fact that I let her soup spoil. And secondly, she's worried that we'll figure out the recipe, right? I mean, I know the recipe, but I mean, I've been, I've been sworn to Croatian blood oath secrecy, right? So, um, first of all, uh, I would like to go on record that my mom's cooking techniques are safe and really, really good. <laughs> the contamination happened after with me going in a lot, so it's the microbiologist's fault, not the Croatian mom's fault. But even, regardless, even though millions of people saw this whole, this whole saga and it blew up and uh, people questioned my mom's, my mom's cooking as a result of that, regardless of all this, what did she do? She wrote me a sonnet. <laughs> so she wrote me a sonnet, Ode to Blue Soup, 
And she framed it and sent it to me in the, in the mail. And I was like, okay, so now Sebastian and my mom are the two purest people that, <laughs> that I know in the world. So, I just work sometimes, but not always. Oh, there we go. So, now what, what's in it? So one thing that literally thousands of comments said were like, is there onion? Is there cabbage? Is there, well, red onion specifically. Is there red wine? Is there garlic? Is there all these things? And I'm like, nope, 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 nope. I've had to like <laughs> answer this a hundred times. So since this is a great debate, no, there's not cabbage, beets, garlic, surprising, because we put this in everything and, uh, when we cook, tomatoes, soy milk, any of this stuff. To a point, this got so out of hand that Liz had to make this meme for me <laughs> so I could just share it. No, these are not in the blue soup. Because um, there are these uh, class of compounds called anthocyanins, which, um, like, if you ever see, like, you know when you um, have red cabbage, if you add vinegar, it turns pink. And if you add baking soda, it turns blue. And so you have these different compounds that could, like, seep into, um, like, from, the, from these different veggies that could seep into and explain the blueness. But it didn't look that color, especially if you take a closer look at the soup. Come on. Next, come on. There we go. Uh, it's, hard to, yeah, it's hard to see with the, with the projector, but if you take a closer look, it looked bacterial. It just, it just, like to us who have been dealing in microbiology for so long, I mean, sorry for any mycologist on there, I didn't think it was fungal, um, because like the texture was a little bit different. And just the color and the turbidity just made me, like, made me, Sebastian, I think, like this probably was bacterial. Also, there's other studies that had been done. Why is this not working? There we go. Other studies that had been done, like Parker, they shared a link, and others shared the link as well, which is a study I'll talk about in a little bit that had found that soy milk and tofu and other people had found cheeses that had turned blue that were as a result of bacteria. So the study that they linked was a Marina de Leon study and, uh, with, her, uh, with her and her colleagues from the Jonathan Eisen lab up at UC Davis. They noticed that soy milk had turned blue and that this tofu had turned blue. And being microbiologists, they're like, we got to take a look at this. So what they did is they aliquoted it onto an LB media, streaked it out, was still producing blue, and they isolated different strains from those. Some of them not only were blue, but they also fluoresced in response to UV light. And what they did as well is they sequenced some of the ones that were, that were some of the colonies that they had uh, isolated, and the two that, turned blue, that were blue were Pseudomonas species. And so specifically when they looked more into it was Pseudomonas carnis. And so we're like, okay, most likely we have a Pseudomonas species in here. Most likely they've already identified what it is. And so these Pseudomonads, they produce a compound called pio, uh, piocyanin. And so that's what the blue, the blue is from that. So we're like, okay, it's maybe that, but why not? You know, it could be something new. It could be a different version of it. It could have a different application. It could be easier to produce for some reason. So let's just take a look. So I'm a microbial genomicist, so I study the genomes of microbes, specifically microbial communities. So I'll look at what's called the metagenome. The metagenome is you take the DNA from an entire microbial community, you sequence it and see what's in there. So what I did is I isolated the DNA from one of those swabs. And so this is a, sp a, a spectrometer a curve where DNA absorbs at 260 right here. And so it shows that I did isolate the DNA at a pretty good yield. And um, Seacoast Genomics, which is a company out in New Hampshire, they were like, gimme, gimme, let me sequence it, let me sequence it. <laughs> so we're all like, sequence all the things. So I sent it off for sequencing to them. Um, while also, so this is what the actual like isolated DNA looks like. It's just a little clear bullet of liquid. Um, I also, so I sent a bullet of that to Sebastian, a, one of the swabs, one of the eight swabs he made me get, dig into. And then I also made this media from like rich bacterial media with uh, beef bouillon uh, put into it. Cause I was like, why not? Maybe it grows in that. And uh, it was kind of funny. It smells like top ramen. I <laughs> would actually make that. I'm like, this is a little weird. I'm like hungry all of a sudden. <laughs> um, but so I sent, as, meanwhile, I sent all these off to Sebastian as well. So he could do his thing. Because his home lab is outfitted for culture work. He went and did his thing. And so the first thing he did is he took that swab and he resuspended it in um, rich, uh, like rich bacterial media. Kind of like let it suspend so it's like nice and turbid so some cells and, and came off of it. 
And then he plated a little bit of that media on two different types of, of media. One which promotes these pyocyanins to turn blue, and another one that promotes fluorescin to, to, be, to be produced, which causes them to fluoresce. And so uh, what was also funny on top of this, when this goes, come on. Um, after he had plated those, he took that tube and he spun it down. And so he spun it down and he saw that the pellet, so the cells spun down at the bottom and the pellet was still blue, but the media, you can't see it here, was also still tinted blue. So both the pellet and the media were tinted blue. Well, first, he's like, I resuspended from a domestic Q-tip. And Mike pointed out, I appreciate the clarity that it was a domestic Q-tip, not a Q-tip that was caught in the wild. <laughs> As scientists, we have to be exact, right? So then Michelle uh, 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 ch chimes in with this makes her sure that this is not probably a pseudomonad producing pyocyanin because she's worked with those in the past and usually while the media is blue the cell pellet still stays like this like beigeous beigeous pinkish colony that way and so uh so she's like most likely it's not the culprit so the soup plot thickens but Philip, I got, I got your puns for you. <laughs> um, so Philip chimes in, well, it is, a, it is like a soup, you know? You might have like some veggies and some debris and stuff that would come down with it. Like maybe the blue is from like the other stuff in the soup. So then Sebastian comes back with, no, I trust biology's like, my, I'm, I'm biology. I trust Aline's like culture instincts and her techniques and stuff. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I literally dumped my hand with Q-tips into a bag that was sitting in the trash for two days. So like all bets are off on this one, but he was right. I definitely didn't get any other plant material. It was really just the supernatant of the broth uh, because no matter what, still a microbiologist at heart. So, but I show you this because this is really the way that scientists banter when it comes to like this type of stuff. It's, it seems kind of ridiculous, but it's true, because you got to get your materials and methods in order. So I said, yeah, all bets are off on this one. I was literally dunking Q-tips into the soup in a double trash bag while gagging. Um, but I was just thinking, like, how absolutely ridiculous when we write this up in a paper, the materials and methods, and the acknowledgement section of the paper is going to be. Um, and then lastly, we figured out how the recipe will appear for the blue soup paper. Recipe available upon reasonable request. So this is code. If, you, uh, if you've ever been involved in scientific publishing at all, that's basically code for we're not giving you this information unless, yeah. <laughs> so um, hence, it's going to be a very protected soup recipe. But it's also a joke because everyone involved in this is really, really in favor of open science and being really transparent with, with everything that we do and make it publicly accessible. So Sebastian's plates grow, and the one that had the media that um, in, uh, encouraged the expression of the fluorescence, they did fluoresce. So we're like, cool, you know, you have something that's, 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 uh, something that's growing on there that does fluoresce. But then the one that uh, was supposed to secrete the pio the, cause the pyocyanin to secrete didn't happen, so nothing turned blue on that one. Meanwhile, I also took a swab and I had streaked it onto, uh, onto the media, those uh, top ramen media, um, at, and I put it at different temperatures. This is um, like body temperature, and then this is room temperature, and this is frig refrigerated temperatures. And what was wild was that like the different microbes grew at the different temperatures, which is expected, but also how well the stuff at refrigerated temperatures grew. But still, no blue. There's still no blue here. And we're like, oh, okay, fine. So then Sebastian's like, okay, let me try something else. He, what? Come on. It's half the time it works, half the time it doesn't. So he read that some Pseudomonas fluorescens species can turn soft cheese blue. And so what he did was he had these mozzarella balls and he put them into these well plates and then aliquoted a little bit of the different cultures from the different, uh, different like, strains that he isolated onto there to see if any of them would turn blue. This is my favorite thing. He labeled this science cheese do not eat. <laughs> you got to make sure, you know, because he's a home lab. You want to make sure that his mom doesn't come in and be like, ooh, yum, you know, type of thing. So, um, so it's, yeah, Sebastian's little quips on all this have just been freaking hilarious. But a few days later, three days later, <laughs> Um, the 30s, the ones that were at 30 degrees Celsius were, they smelled unique and they melted a little bit. Um, they fluoresced, but there was still no blue. 
So it was like, okay, cool, we got a funky cheese experiment, got some fluorescence, but still no blue. So we're scratching our heads about this, but, um, so, but we, we get busy, because Sebastian has a day job, aside from going after blue soup. So do I, but I was down with COVID during this time, so I was also isolated for a week. So we were just kind of like off uh, taking a break, but then Sebastian looks in his fridge. We're like, everyone, keep calm turned bright blue. Um, it was more like an indigo, really, but, I don't, but after like another week, the streak, the streak plates that were in the fridge turned blue. We're like, oh my God, we finally got it. And so I was like, well, I need to get back out of isolation so I can go check the ones in my fridge. And the ones in my fridge also turned the same indigo color, even though, uh, even though it was on different media than what, he was, than what he was plating. And so what was interesting was that the ones that were at refrigerated temperatures at four degrees Celsius, were blue, but the ones at room temperature were not. And so we're like, this is really cool. This is definitely something that's specific to it being, um, to it being in the cold. So we're like, ooh, this is exciting. And so Sebastian then takes, there's some strains, you can see a couple colonies, this is dark blue, this one's dark blue, and there's another one up here that's dark blue. He picked those and he restreaked those so that we could sequence those later. So while we're getting excited about the blue, we have two types of sequencing data that come back. One is called 16S sequencing. That's when you sequence a single gene in a population of cells, and it kind of just tells you who is there and in what relative amounts. That's really the only information you can get from that. And then we did another type of sequencing called shotgun sequencing, which has that name because you sequence everything, all the DNA, so all the genes in a population, every bit of DNA that's in there. So the 16S seq, it's faster, it's cheaper, so that's why we did it first real fast. And we've preliminary look at it. It's not surprising that the vast majority of the population is pseudomonas. There's different pseudomonads in there. We're like, okay, so probably is pseudomonas. Um, but there's a chunk of enterobacter and lactobacilli in there too. And then we get the shotgun results back, and the preliminary analyses support the 16S data that it's predominantly pseudomonads, but we're gonna dive in. Well, one thing I was particularly proud of is despite using the domestic Q-tip and my crude sampling techniques, there was only 0.08% of human DNA in there. So I was like, cool, all right, cool. So I still, still, still got it, still got it, right? I'm kidding. Um, so then I got really busy and Seek Coast were like, can't sit on our hands anymore. Come on, we gotta analyze this stuff. We gotta know, we have data right in front of us. We need to analyze it. So they couldn't wait for me to look into the shotgun data, so they went ahead and did the analyses themselves. And so what they did is they had the shotgun DNA sequencing. They, uh, what you first do is imagine a metagenome, like a microbial community, is you have a thousand jigsaw puzzles and each of them are a thousand pieces each. The numbers are way bigger than this, but I'm just rounding it up so that you can kind of imagine it in your head. What you do to sequence is you isolate everything and you undo the, all the puzzles. So you have a bunch of puzzle pieces from a thousand different jigsaw puzzles and a thousand pieces per puzzle. So that's what you end up sequencing. And then you have to use computers to assemble those puzzles back together. So first, what you would do is you just look at your pile of puzzle pieces and you try to find some connections. So you try to build them like as, in, into as many kind of clumps. Like you have one that's like a thing of seagulls. Okay, let me build as many seagulls as I can. You have another one that's mountains. Okay, let me build as many mountains as I can. But they all have sky and they all have like maybe grass or something. So you can kind of put them together in a chunks as best as you can. But then you look at a database. Your database is your covers of all those puzzles. And you're like, okay, this chunk kind of goes there. This chunk kind of goes there but also you kind of want to put them into bins based off of how similar they are. So you're going to put all the seagullish ones that are even though things are left over into one bin and you kind of put them in. So you use these combination of techniques to kind of assemble your puzzles and put them into different bins as you will. So you can separate those into a thousand different puzzles. So you, uh, as you can imagine it's not a perfect system, but you can get kind of most of those puzzles kind of put into those bins depending. So they did this and then they found that one of the puzzle pieces, was, one, of the, one of the puzzles they assembled was Serratia quinovorans. And so I say Serratia, I, I did a Twitter poll, and the, the majority of people said it's pronounced Serratia instead of Serratia, so I apologize to the non-US folks. <laughs> um, that is what the Twitter poll said. Um, so it is uh, Serratia quinovorans. And in that puzzle, there is genes that, synth that, that encode the biosynthetic pathway for indigoidine. 
And so most likely what this is, is that the blue that's being produced is indigoidine, which is used as an environmentally friendly dye. And so we're like, cool, so our sequencing data suggest in that bin that Serratia quinovorans, which only makes up 8% of the population, it's not the majority of those pseudomonads. So 8% of the population are these Serratia quinovorans, and most likely it's indigoidine that is, um, that, that, that is actually producing this blue color that we're seeing. So again, this is just genomic, this is the, looking at the genomic data, we have to validate it. So, but in the meantime, Twitter ends up doing its thing. Where they start, we thought it was a Pseudomonas species at first, and then here comes Serratia quinovorans passing it by and everything. Like, oops, sorry, you're the one in, you're the one in charge now. Uh, Brian, wait, this one <laughs> used to be Pseudomonas, uh, Pseudomonas, and then um, now it's Serratia quinovorans. And my personal favorite is, is this one, the Serratia quinovorans, like now over, like being the the popular one. And of course, because Twitter couldn't let it go, now you have to make it blue. <laughs> so there's a lot of memes coming from this, um, which was like pretty shocking because everyone thought that it was going to be a pseudomonad that's in there. So what's next? The first thing we need to do is sequence more things. So we're going to sequence those strains that uh, Sebastian had isolated that either uptook the blue or some that were producing that blue. And then we also, come on. Bring in the chemists, you know, chemists, you know, sometimes they're good for something, kidding y'all. Um, and so we did have our, our Department of Chemistry on campus is super, super generous, so they did take some of the swab of the blue soup and then they ran uh, liquid chromatography mass, mass spectrometry on it so that they can identify what compounds are in there. But also we're going to try to extract the blue from those plates and run, uh, run an NMR on it which could actually uh, like get the structure of that molecule because maybe it's a different version of indigoidine. Maybe it's something new. You know, it might just be the same thing, but you won't know until you check, right? And then lastly, publish. And be really, really cool is that I get to be on a paper with my mom, and not just my mom, but like the scientific community as well, that like brought me so much joy throughout this whole process. And so this kind of, <laughs> this made some headlines. It started by blowing up on IF, uh, IFing Love Science. And then other journals, uh, Biotechnique, CNN, it's funny, my fiance is, uh, is an organic chemist and he's like, you're not even in chemistry and you made, uh, chem so this is chemistry and engineering news. He's like, you made it before I did. Like, what the heck, you know, type of thing. Um, and then MIT Technology Review, it was also on NPR in Colorado or something. <laughs> so it was like, I'm like, y'all are getting excited about Blue Soup, but it's fun. And also someone made a color palette from the blue soup, so whenever we, and they already are like using it to make charts, uh, to make charts and publishable figures and such. So it's a, it's a very soothing palette. I wonder if anyone can use it for like their uh, interior decorating or something. But really what this all is about is a reminder of why we do what we do. Like science is about curiosity. Science is about helping improve our world. Science is about, um, working together on all of this. It's about, uh, about the community that comes together and the absolute excitement and joy and the openness and communication and the willing to share ideas and expertise has just been absolutely like overwhelming uh, from, from the science Twitter community. And not just from scientists, you had so many people that were not scientists that just, they were just curious about it. And that just made, it just reminded us why we get into this because we're so busy chasing grants and trying to publish and like with the job market being what it is, it's just so easy to be stressed out and forget about why we fell in love with science and this was really a great reminder. And not only that, but like, but Rebecca puts it, puts it perfectly. This is why I love my fellow scientists in science Twitter because especially as someone who was a junior faculty during when the pandemic hit, um, like, this community made me feel less lonely during the shutdown when we couldn't be around anyone. And they not only were there for, for joy and support and discourse, that's a thing, scientists do that, um, but they shared resources and like helped each other through it and brought so much joy through all of this that it's just, it's just been such a special part of my life and I'm so grateful to be a part of it. So this, so this is the story, like I said, of a microbiologist who studied her rotten soup and found uh, and built 
a awesome story and community from that. That was a lot of fun. So thank you all so much for your attention and I can't wait for where this goes. So once again, Dr. Beckett will be staying after the assembly to chat. So please uh, feel free to say hi and ask her uh, if you had any questions from that. So next up, we will uh, have another thing along with Paul. This one is going to be the grandmother song. My grandma used to make blue soup. She would take a big pot of soup and stick it back in the refrigerator, and then we'd come over like a month later. She'd pull it out. It was blue. It was no big deal. You know, I said, what is this, Grandma? And she goes, it's blue soup. I said, do you eat it? She said, sometimes. I said, what about the other time? She said, sometimes you just let it sit there. Uh, she said, she talked about some uh, weird mind ex experiences she had after eating the blue soup. So blue soup might be a problem. But then she would, she would uh, eat the blue soup and then she'd sit down and say, I got some stuff to tell you. Let me tell you about life. Be courteous, kind, and forgiving. Be gentle and peaceful each day. Be warm and human and grateful. And have a good thing to say. Be thoughtful and trustful and childlike. Be warm and witty and wise. Be honest and love all your neighbors. Be obsequious, purple and clairvoyant. She said that. Be pompous and rude and eat cactus. Be dull and boring and omnipresent. Criticize things you don't know about. Be oblong and have your knees removed. Okay, Grandma. More soup. Never go on a date with Bigfoot or wear snowshoes in a minefield. Try not to think about televangelists. Go into a closet and suck eggs. Be tasteless, crude, and offensive. Live in a swamp and be three-dimensional. Put a live chicken in your underwear. Get all excited and go to a yawning festival. Grandma was on Blue Soup. We're all going to sing this together. I'll throw out the words and you just sing it. It gets a little crazy, but let's try it. There's no words up there. It's just come. Be courteous, kind, and forgiving. Be courteous, kind, and forgiving. Be gentle and peaceful each day. Be gentle and peace. Be warm and human and grateful. Be warm and human and and have a good thing to say. And have a good thing to say. Be thoughtful and trustful and childlike. Be thoughtful, trustful, and childlike. Be witty and happy and wise. Be witty and happy and wise. Be honest and love all your neighbors. Be honest and love all your neighbors. Be obsequious, purple, and clairvoyant. Be obsequious, purple, and clairvoyant. Be pompous and rude and eat cactus. Be pompous and rude and eat cactus. Be dull and boring and omnipresent. Be dull and boring and omnipresent. Criticize things you don't know about. Criticize things you don't know about. Be oblong and have your knees removed. Be oblong and have your knees removed. Never go on a date with Bigfoot. Never go on a date with Bigfoot. Or wear snowshoes in the minefield. Wear snowshoes out in the minefield. Try not to think about televangelists. Try not to think about televangelists. Go in a closet and suck eggs. Go in a closet and suck eggs. Oh, I guess sound great. Grandma would be so happy. Be tasteless, crude, and offensive. Be tasteless, crude, and offensive. Live in a swamp and be three-dimensional. Live in a swamp and be three-dimensional. Put a live chicken in your underwear. Put a live chicken in your... Get all excited and go to a yawning festival. Get all excited and go to a yawning festival. That was a trip. Yeah, it was.
I feel sorry for anyone who has to follow up that. So next we have the MC address with James King. Oh, hi guys, I'm James King. Hey hi, man, James I'm gonna follow that up. <laughs> so just a, a little bit about me. Um, I, I, I wanted to, to talk about uh, today's theme is blues or blue clues. No copyright infringement. Um, so I wanted to talk about color and I wanted to talk about clues. Um, my, what I'm going to talk about is a little science -y, um, but I want to preface I'm not a scientist like Dr. Beckett. I have a master's degree in material science and I did work in uh, some research labs, um, both national labs and in university. Um, but uh, like Dr. Beckett said, scientists have to be precise and I'm a scientist. So I'm not going to be very precise with you guys. I don't have uh, quite as many uh, demos, uh, but I thought some of this uh, you might find interesting. Uh, things that I learned about color and butterflies and clues when uh, I was doing research in grad school. Uh, so for an intro, uh, I'll go into why color is so weird, just as an idea. Uh, in some ways, color is an entirely social construct. Okay, I'm not talking about color like skin color or race, not my uh, area of expertise. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be upfront about that. Um, but even beyond like the philosophical, is my blue the same as your blue? Like, do we see the same blue, man? Uh, <laughs> color as a concept is weird because uh, it can mean, it means different things. And a lot of scientific terms have a different scientific and everyday meaning, like theory um, is a very common one where if you have a theory about something every day, it's like, oh, I have this idea, but a theory scientifically has to be very uh, solidly held up. So in terms of physics, a color is a single wavelength of light, um, at least as we, we know about it, a, a simple color is a wavelength of light, but like every day, when we talk about color, we talk about what we see with our eyes. Um, like, I see that this floor is orange and the display is, is dark green. Um, but here's the thing about what we see. We don't actually see all the colors on the visual spectrum. We only see three colors. We only have three receptors in our eye that can pick up different things. They're, they're called cones, I'm sure you've heard of them. And they only actually pick up red, green, and blue. Um, which doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because if you can only see three things, then uh, how are you like getting all of this, these different, this, these different colors out of it? This would be a lot easier if I had, I, I'm sorry, I didn't prepare. Pride was uh, just very busy with all of us. If I had a spectrum that I could show you guys, uh, it would make this a lot easier to kind of explain um, Perfect. Uh, could I get a volunteer to hold this up so that I can? Awesome. I love enthusiasm. So just hold this up for me. So the three, like I said, cones are red, green, and blue. Now you might be thinking, okay, how does that make you see different, see all the colors? Well, here's the thing: the red cone doesn't just pick up red. It picks up red very strongly, but it if it hits with, it's hit with orange light, it picks it up a little, and if it's hit with yellow, it picks it up a little bit less. And the green one also hits, reacts, sends a very strong signal if it gets green light, but it also sends a bit of a weaker signal if it gets yellow, and a little bit weaker signal if it gets orange. So if you're following with me, what happens is, if your brain gets a signal that's a little bit of the green and a little bit of the red, but none of the blue, because the blue doesn't go all the way there, you see it as orange. Because when orange light hits your eyes, it stimulates the red one and the green one, but not the blue one. Um, and the same applies for uh, purple, for example. So you're you might be thinking, if you only see blue, how do you see something that's beyond blue? Well, the purple will stimulate your blue receptor a little bit, but it won't stimulate any of the other ones because blue picks it up, but green only picks up into the blue. So if you only get a blue signal, 
you're actually seeing purple light. And your brain tells you it's purple even though it's only coming from the blue cone. Um, now you might be thinking though, on this spectrum, on the rainbow, there are colors that we see that we don't see in the rainbow, like pink or brown. And I'm here to tell you that those don't exist. <laughs> they are fake, they do not. Okay, how it actually works is, now in nature there's no wavelength that'll stimulate your red cone and your blue cone because they don't overlap in what makes them send signal. But things do that because things exist that give off red light and blue light, um, or red light and blue light and green light. Almost everything that's exposed to white light gives off some of each of them. It's just the ratios of those three that allow you to get different colors. So pink is actually a lot of red, some blue, some green. And brown is the same thing. And that's why, so every one of your phones, every screen that you look at that's an uh, uh, RGB display, red, green, blue, every pixel is actually just three different lights in there. And then it shows you those three different lights and different ratios, and your brain's able to pick those up as all the different colors. Uh, so I thought that that was so cool when I learned it. Um, thank you so much for your help. Um, now on to uh, what I did in my, in my research as a, a grad student during my master's. Um, so things in nature, give off colors, and you might be thinking, how, how do, okay, so what makes something a color? And usually, uh, something gives off a color, you know, I did not pick up, okay, green, the shirt is green, not because it's giving, it's radiating off a light. It's green because white light's hitting it, and then it's absorbing everything that isn't green, and then the green light is bounced off, and that's what we see. And most things in nature, like plants, will have pigments that absorb all the light that isn't that color, but that isn't the only way it works. So, could you put up my slide? Um, butterfly wings, specifically blue morpho butterfly wings, are very weird in how they look in nature. Uh, because they don't, and this is our first clue, they don't just reflect blue light, uh, they reflect it directionally. So if you look at them from one angle, so that's the top picture, you don't see the blue. But if you look at it from another angle, which is, a, so this is the same butterfly, same room, same light, same everything, just a slightly different camera angle, you see all that blue. And if it was just a pigment absorbing and releasing light, that's not how it works, it doesn't make sense. Um, so I worked, my background is in nanotechnology and we are, I was part of the nanotechnology lab and uh, we wanted to look at this and figure out if we could reproduce it and study it for uh, the blue morpho butterfly and different butterflies. So it turns out if you're a chemist or a, an environmental chemistry and nanotechnology lab, uh, we don't have a whole lot of experience with animal subjects. And it turns out if you're trying to get an animal uh, sample that the animal needs to be sacrificed for, and sacrifice is what you call it when you euthanize an animal to study them. Uh, there's like an ethics board you have to go through, and it takes a long time, and I only had five months left in my master's degree. Um, so first we partnered with a local museum, which was lovely. They were great. They had a whole butterfly exhibit, and uh, we thought, okay, this is perfect because the butterflies there can live out their whole natural butterfly lives, doing whatever butterflies do, I guess. Um, and then they'll die naturally, and they collect the samples for us at the museum and then we look at them. But, and I was so psyched for this because these people were great. But when we got the first sample, it turns out when butterfly lives, butterflies live a long, happy, natural life. Um, so butterflies are called Lepidoptera. And Lepidoptera is Latin for scaled wing. And as they live their lives, those scales will fall off. They get ragged, they get beaten down. And by the time we would get these samples, they don't have the scale surfaces on them that we were able to analyze. Now, in my personal life around this time, 
uh, I knew I was moving to California for my PhD at the end of the summer, but there was this girl that I was smitten with. Um, woman, I should say woman, that I was smitten with. And on one of our first dates, I was talking about my research, like any researcher does. And I, I was talking about this, this problem that I was having. Uh, and she was like, you know, funny coincidence, my father is a lepidopterist. And she took me to, to meet him. Um, it turns out a lepidopterist is not a person with scaly wings. It is a person who studies butterflies, uh, which was much less creepy. And, and when I met him, their house was covered in butterflies. Like every wall, plastered in butterflies. Drawers full of butterflies, boxes of butterflies. Oh my god. And I was like, hey, uh, do you have blue morpho? And he's like, here's my blue morpho closet. Um, and he was willing to part with some samples. He was really excited about it, actually. And I was like, huh, this feels like a bit of a clue about, you know, this relationship. But you know what? I'll finish up telling you about what we found out when we studied these things under the microscope. So you can see here that the wings are layered. And then at the very tiniest scale, the one micron scale, they are spaced apart very evenly along a gradient. And that's because they don't use pigment to give their color. They use their structure to give color. Because those layers that make the blue are made of chitin, the same thing that are in crab shells. It's clear or a vague pale yellow. Um, but because they're slated exactly 458, or 450 to 480 nanometers across from each other, when light hits them, light that isn't blue destructively interferes. The light that is blue constructively interferes. So what that means uh, is, and this is a very precise demonstration, when, let's say this is one layer and this is another layer, uh, if blue light hits and two pieces of blue light house, pass through and then come back out, they wiggle together because they're coming out at the same length as each other. But, and this is very precise and, and scientific, I swear, uh, if it's red, which is longer, they hit into each other, and they don't have as strong of a signal as they come back out. Parts of them interfere with each other. So any two waves that inter interact, if the height of the wave meets the height of the other wave, they increase. If the height of one wave meets the trough of the other wave, they cancel each other out. So when blue hits, it only interferes in a way that jives with itself. But anything else, it distorts and is reduced. So that doesn't mean that other colors aren't reflected. It just means that they're reflected less than blue because blue doesn't have that destructive interference and red and green and all those other colors that I talked about already do. So I thought that, that was really cool. And you might be thinking, well, why does this matter? Why, why, do, why do they want it need to be blue? Why do they need this structure um, that is different at different angles? Because if light hits it from the side, it doesn't hit those plates, so it doesn't get that reflection. But if it, sorry, if light hits it directly above, it doesn't bounce between, through those plates. But if it hits it from the side, it does. Um, and honestly, I'm not a biologist, but I think the most likely answer there is at some point in time, there was a butterfly that it happened to via mutation. And a whole bunch of other butterflies looked at that and was like, this is awakened the latent horniness in me. <laughs> um, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and so, I took this whole kind of experience and I was this entire time really focused on just getting into, getting through to my PhD program. Um, I wasn't too into the actual like writing things up or uh, putting in for like SEM time and looking at stuff under the microscope, but uh, I was into being a scientist 
And I was really into that woman, and I took it as a clue, and uh, we ended up moving to California together, which was pretty cool, uh, or at least I thought, because it actually that woman is my ex-wife, and that relationship was a disaster. <laughs> uh, so maybe uh, that that was a bit of a lesson on following clues. Uh, maybe look for clues, then make your hypothesis, or make your something out of it. Don't uh, go from what you want and then look for clues for it. But there's actually, and I debated on, on adding this part at the end, but I think it, it makes it a more complete and true story. Um, and I mentioned this at the, the last time I came up here and talked for a personal moment, but I actually failed out of that PhD program one semester in. Um, like I didn't, I, I didn't even make it one semester. And that was like a huge clue in for me. Because to do science, to be a scientist, you really need that passion. You need to love your subject and what you're doing. And I didn't. I loved feeling like a scientist and being a scientist and knowing things. But the actual writing and lab work, like, I just didn't have it in me. And there were clues along the way that I kept ignoring and ignoring and ignoring until my body and my mind were like, no, we're, we're not doing this anymore. And when I clued into that and actually focused on what I was into and what I was good at, I liked learning things and I liked making things. Um, and I went into turbine design and, and did that for a while, and that was pretty cool. But uh, my growing up, my dad uh, was a bureaucrat. He worked for a four-letter organization in the government that you won't recognize and did paperwork all the time. And I loved talking to him about this. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And that was also a thing where I was like, no, paperwork's lame. Like, everyone tells me that's, that's the lamest thing ever. But now that I, 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 I was like, okay, you know what? Things were really hard in grad school. Things were really hard in my first job. Maybe I should try something more like that. And I applied for a government job as a bureaucrat where it's all boring paperwork. And I came here for that job because I was doing a lot of back and forth. And oh my god, I freaking love paperwork. <laughs> like being a bureaucrat and filing papers and doing analysis and making charts and telling people stuff, that was cool to me. And I feel like that was what happened when I actually looked at the clues that were in front of me and despite the conclusion that I wanted, followed them anyway. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, at this point, we'll take a minute of reflection. Uh, so, what is coming up with uh, Sunday Assembly? We have Alexis here to tell us what's going on. Hello. All right. Real quick, we are having a special assembly at a new venue in North County. We're trying to branch out. It will be with um, the same speaker on bubbles we had here. So, you've heard this one before, but we're going to try it out with our new North County friends. And that will be on June 30th. Right. July. That's because it's Pride Month. 
San Diego, should be in June. But anyway, next slide. Uh, we're going to do another Roaming Restaurants where we just eat and talk, and that will be Saturday, July 22nd from 4 to 6. It will be at the Liberty Public Market. And next slide, um, we are going to do a food, fun with food and friends. It will be in Balboa Park. No, got the wrong notes. Working class in North Park on August 6th. Next slide. Are we out of slides? This is the Roaming Restaurants one for um, Saturday. And then all of our stuff is on Meetup. So if you don't want to hear me very sleep deprived ramble on about stuff, just go to Meetup and it'll show all the things coming up. But um, we've got Roaming Restaurants Saturday, August 19th in National City. It will be marked on 8th. Next slide. Uh, we've got the Liberty Station Art Walk, which is coming up on August 5th at 11. Bring your sunscreen. Next slide. <laughs> we've got the Balboa Park Walk uh, and Carnivorous Plant Show on August 6th. That'll be fun. Next slide. All right. I'm out of slides, but I do have one more uh, announcement for Pride. We will be there today at the festival until closing. Closing. If you want to join us, we're walking over there after assembly. And we have our Azumblers that want to say hi. So if you wave this direction. Hey, Azumblers, turn on your cameras. There you, oh, there you, there you are. Zoomblers. Hi, Azumblers. All right, and that's it for announcements. Please join us. And if you have an idea for an announcement, let us know. And now, now uh, we have one more sing-along with Paul, uh, one that I think you might be more familiar with than the previous one. Hey, they did uh, great on that. You mean the grandmother song? Yeah. Oh, the, everybody knows that. Uh, well, Paul, with what a wonderful world. Yes. Okay. So, my, by the way, my grandmother had blue butterflies all over her house. That's what she made the soup out of. All right, let's sing this thing. You guys know it. Oh, don't know much about history. Don't know much biology. Don't know much about science book. Don't know much about the French I took. But I do know that I love Geometry. Don't know much trigonometry. Don't know much about algebra. Don't know what a slide rule is for, neither does anybody else. But I do know one and one is two. And if this one could be with you, what a wonderful world this would be. Oh, well, I don't claim to be an A student. Let's get up. Oh, but I'm trying to be man, man, baby, by being an A student, baby. I could win your play a solo there, Jeff. Let's do that verse again. Let's do it all the way through. Here we go. Well, I don't know much about the Middle Ages. I saw the pictures and I turned the pages. Don't know nothing about the rise and fall. Don't know nothing about nothing. Oh, but I do. And if I could only win your love, what a wonderful world this would be. La 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 serene. La 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 biology. La 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 science book. La 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 bitch I took. Oh, but I do. I love you. And I know 
that if you love me too, what a wonderful world this would be. What a wonderful world this would be. Oh, what a wonderful world this would be. Oh, what a wonderful world this would be. Dr. Beckett will be staying here after to chat and answer your questions, so please stick around after the assembly. There are snacks and coffee. Um, I've heard there are donuts that are very good. Uh, and after that, please come see us at the Sunday assembly booth at the Pride Festival. Thank you all so much for coming. Yay!